My name is Ben Krupps. It's my privilege to serve as the lead pastor here at Living Hope. And now it is our privilege together to open up the Word of God. So if you would open up your Bible to the book of Romans, chapter 15, verses 30 through 33. I will leave you in suspense no longer. A couple of weeks ago, I gave a hint about the next sermon series, the next book we're going to go through, and a number of you have been guessing and have been anxious about what it will be. It's going to be Ecclesiastes. So there you go. Now you know. Have you ever struggled with the reality that God has planned the end from the beginning that all things happen according to the counsel of his will, that no one can thwart his sovereign purposes in the world, and how that works with intercessory prayer. So, for instance, Isaiah 46, 9 and 10 says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. Or Nebuchadnezzar, having been taught a lesson in Daniel 4.35, says, all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing and he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? Or 2 Chronicles 20, verse 6, O Lord, God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. In your hand are power and might so that none is able to withstand you. Or one more, Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man that he should lie or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said and will he not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not fulfill it? So we could go on and on. He has planned and therefore knows the beginning to the end of human history. No one can change his mind or thwart his will For he works all things according to the counsel of his own will. And yet, alongside these awesome realities of our God, as revealed in Scripture, are many, many exhortations for us to pray. Pray without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians 5.17. Romans 12.12. Be constant in prayer. Or James 4.2. You do not have because you do not ask. In prayer, and the list goes on. So, which is it? That God has planned and therefore knows the end from the beginning, and nothing and no one can resist him or thwart him as he works out the counsel of his own will in all things, or that we as finite and fallen creatures have the almost unspeakable privilege of actually interacting with our God in a way that changes things. That he responds to our prayers. And that there are a million things in this world that would not happen apart from our prayers. There is much mystery here, but happily both are true. In fact, the reality of his absolute unwavering sovereignty over all things is a great confidence for us that we take hold of in prayer. He has ordained even our prayers, and we can pray boldly for all sorts of things, knowing that he can do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think. John Piper has written, if you do not avail yourself of the privilege of bringing to pass events in the universe that would not take place if you didn't pray, you are acting like a colossal fool, aren't you? Well, the Apostle Paul knows these realities intimately. And so in our text, as he continues to provide us a compelling model of partnership that we began to explore last week, he makes an appeal. He makes an appeal for the church in Rome to join him in praying to the God who is sovereign over all things and who loves to hear and answer the prayers of his saints. So let's turn to Romans 15. Starting in verse 30, 
remembering that this is the word of God. I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. May the God of peace be with you all. Amen. May the Lord bless the preaching of his word. All right, let's just jump right into the text. Let's work our way through what Paul is saying here. Let's look at the appeal he's making first, and then we'll look at his prayer request list that he describes as well. So first, his appeal. We saw last week, earlier in chapter 15, in verses 22 through 29, Paul setting an example of what healthy and potent partnership can look like, both within a local church and extra-locally. Healthy partnership is marked by relationship, shared ministry, and blessing. And here, then, he appeals to another central piece to healthy partnership, united corporate prayer. And here, he reflects his deep concerns about his upcoming trip. Clearly, he has a deep concern about the trip. We see that in the language that he uses. He, he says, I appeal to you. Or you can also, in looking at the original language, say, hear him saying, I urge you. There's an urgency to this request. By our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf. You can essentially hear the concern and the urgency in his voice as he faces what lies ahead. And here he asks for and communicates an important truth about faithful prayer taught elsewhere in Scripture, that there is something important not only in being faithful to prayer, but in striving prayer, discipline, struggling prayer, fervent prayer. He has already written earlier in Romans 12, 12, be constant in prayer. Here he says, strive with me in prayer. And we see something of this in what Jesus said in Luke chapter 18 to illustrate. And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. He said, in a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man, but there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, give me justice against my adversary. For a while, he refused. But afterward, he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge says, just in case you're tempted to think, We're supposed to emulate the judge and his character. Here what the unrighteous judge says, and will not God, who is righteous, and will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Jesus is talking about something like this, this striving prayer, this crying out to God persistently in prayer. And note in verse 30, he gives them incentives. He gives them reasons to stimulate them to pray in this way. He says, I appeal to you by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit. What's he describing here? His appeal comes under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. He and the Christians in Rome and all Christians throughout history, we have one Lord who has all authority. We all live together under his authority. And it stimulates us to cry out to this Lord Jesus Christ. And furthermore, we are united with one another by faith in him in light of the sweet and fruitful realities of our shared union with the Lord Jesus Christ by faith. He says, that's a reason to pray for me. Secondly, he says, the love of the Spirit. And what he's describing here is not the love that the Holy Spirit has for the Christian, which is a sweet reality, but 
what he's describing is this is the love for brothers and sisters in Christ that is the fruit and effect of the Spirit's work in all who are born again. That sincere love that is exhorted to earlier in Romans for one another that blossoms in a heart that has been transformed by the grace of God. And he reminds them of this spirit-produced love in their hearts as a stimulus to pray for him. John Calvin, commenting on this verse, says, Paul shows how the godly ought to pray for their brethren, that they are to assume their person as though they were placed in the same difficulties. Sincere love for others brought into our lives through the work of the Holy Spirit provokes a striving and earnestness in prayer as if we have been placed in the same difficulties of those we are praying for. He appeals to these transcendent realities because he is certain that they will stimulate every Christian in Rome to pray, just as it will stimulate every born-again Christian who reads these verses. So, striving prayer is the fruit of an awareness that those whom we pray for are fellow heirs of the grace of God in Christ, that we are all united at the deepest level of existence under the lordship of Jesus Christ, and as the Spirit grows within us an awareness of the greatness of God's love for us in Christ that tenderizes our hearts and stimulates deep affection for brothers and sisters even if we haven't met them. And by the way, Paul has not met them. His expectation is they will strive because of these realities that they've never even met in person. And I think we can all relate to that kind of love and fervency in prayer for those that we have not met. I've been affected by reading the story of a pastor who leads Grace Life Church in Edmonton, Canada, James Coates, who has been in jail for weeks with no end in sight because he refused to comply with what he perceived as heavy-handed governmental restrictions related to COVID-19 believing that they restricted their ability to worship as commanded by God. Now, I've never met that guy. I don't even know what that guy looks like. But my heart moves towards God to pray for a man like this. Wherever we, wherever we are in the discussion around the pandemic, that church has a pastor in jail, and they are plodding forward in faith, crying out to God, it's easy to join in prayer for our brothers and sisters who are suffering, even if we haven't met them. So we're, let's transfer some of this to our lives. We are reminded here that there is a vital place for fervent, striving prayer when we pray for one another. James 5, 16 through 18 says, Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. And then he prayed again. And heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. Here there is a sense in which Paul is inviting the Roman church and us out of the routine of a mundane prayer life in order to pursue fervency, earnestness, striving in our prayers for one another. This is not just a routine prayer life. Striving, fervency, crying out to God, desiring for God's will to be done. And listen, if Paul... The Apostle Paul, the man who was commissioned personally by the risen Christ, the man who established Christianity, humanly speaking, from Jerusalem to Illyricum, the one who penned the majority of the New Testament, feels his need for prayer. Oh, listen, this pastor feels that need all the more. And your pastors feel our need for your prayers. There's immediate application here as he exhorts, as he invites those whom he loves and whom he is pastoring through this book to pray, striving in prayer for him, your pastors would ask the same thing, knowing 
I hope you do, that we pray for you. Charles Spurgeon once said, no man can do me a truer kindness in this world than to pray for me. And on a regular basis, I encounter people in this church, some of you who come up to me and say, I was praying for you. We prayed for you. Our family's praying for you. And let me tell you, that is maybe one of the very most encouraging things that I could ever hear. And I thank God that I serve in a praying church. Pray for the leaders of this church. Pray for the pastors. Pray for the community group leaders. We need God's grace, just as Paul did. All right, secondly, he provides his prayer requests. He says, strive together in prayer for two things in verse 31. He says, that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea. He was anticipating opposition, persecution from unbelievers as he experienced all throughout his life in ministry. And we note as well that Paul does not shy away from that kind of suffering and opposition, but he doesn't invite it either. So he's willing to suffer for the sake of Christ, but he's also willing to say, pray that I don't have to go through that and God would rescue me from this. That's a helpful way to think about persecution. There are times to run from it. There are times that God must move to rescue Christians from it while not shying away from a willingness to suffer for Christ. Second, he says that my service for for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. You may recall that he informed the church in Rome earlier in this chapter that he was on his way to Jerusalem to bring financial relief to impoverished Jewish Christians, money he had collected from the churches in Macedonia and Achaia. Do you find this curious? Why wouldn't that be acceptable? Maybe, Maybe you find this curious. I do at first glance. Listen, if, if you're going to bring me a pile of cash, you don't need to pray that I will find it acceptable, just FYI. You know, if, if a bag of cash is coming my way, no need to organize an emergency prayer meeting that Ben will be receptive to the gift. So what is he talking about? Well, the book of Acts and Paul's letters inform us that there were certain strains of conservative Jewish Christians who were suspicious about Paul and his law-free gospel. For Paul did preach the gospel of grace apart from works, and that made, that made some people nervous about his ministry. So Paul prays that God would move in their hearts to receive him with love and acceptance. Here then, he's asking for a prayer that highlights a reality of God's sovereignty. Notice, he prays in effect that if these Jewish Christians are resistant to Paul, that God would actually change their wills to accept Paul. And then this would seem to undermine the idea that we are purely autonomous people with free wills that God would never interfere with. No, God does work in the hearts and minds of others powerfully. And even as Paul invites the reader to pray to our sovereign God, we can and should pray and ask him to intervene and work in the hearts and minds of others. Listen, if we're praying for someone that we love who is far from Christ, and we're praying for their salvation, it is a very normal and natural and healthy thing to pray, God, save them. Not, okay, God, can you make some conditions around this person to be sort of amenable to them being considering and hopefully figuring out their way to engage their wills to put faith in Christ? No, because God does work in the hearts and minds of men. We can cry out to God and say, save them. Take hold of them. It would seem that however one may differ about the extent of God's sovereignty We, for the most part, all pray like this. All with an understanding that what is preeminent is the will of God. John Stott, commenting on these verses, says, The purpose of prayer 
is emphatically not to bend God's will to ours, but rather to align our will to his. The promise that our prayer will be answered is conditional on asking according to his will. Consequently, every prayer we pray should be a variation on the theme, your will be done. And we see Paul reflecting just that sort of thing in verse 32. He says, so that by God's will, I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. He's he's reiterating his desire to connect with these beloved people in the church at Rome that he talked about earlier in verse 22 and 24. He's saying his desire is to come to them and to find joy and refreshment, a good desire, but with the understanding that this and everything else will only happen if it is the will of God for it to be so. And so even his good and healthy desires, he subordinates, he submits to the will of God. And if we pull back and evaluate Paul's biography in Acts and elsewhere, we find, interestingly, that God did answer these prayers, but in an unexpected way. Doug Moo, commenting on these verses, says he was delivered from the unbelievers in Judea, but only by being locked up by the Romans for two years. The collection was apparently accepted by the Jewish Christians, but Paul's subsequent arrest in the temple, precincts must have raised Jewish Christian suspicions about him again. And Paul did get to Rome and experience some measure of joy and refreshment, but he arrived there in Roman chains. And so understanding this, we remember that God does answer prayer, but not necessarily in the way that we think he will. Verse 33, even as he makes his appeal, asking them to pray with him, in typical Paul fashion, he just can't help himself, and he prays for them. May the God of peace be with you all. Now that is a prayer Paul is confident will be fulfilled, for he knows and we should know that wherever there are those who are in Christ, the God of peace is present personally. So as we reflect on this text, there is an implicit invitation to press into God, our sovereign God, in prayer. We can pray big prayers, and God is able to do all that he wills to do. And so we can gather, as we do each month over here in the family room for the missions prayer meeting, where a group of faithful Prayers gather together, praying for people they have never met and may never meet, asking for God to work in the nations, and happily hearing reports here and there about how God is working. Let me say this as well. Here, then, if I want to draw out a piece of application, it would be to not give up on praying fervently for those whom you love, for whatever their need is, for their salvation, for their health, for relationship, discord. Let me encourage you to, if you have felt weary in your prayer life, you have been praying for a long time. Keep striving in prayer. Keep striving. Unless you hear a clear no. Thus you hear it clear, no, continue to cry out to God, trusting him. Maybe you have been praying for a long time and your prayers don't appear to be answered. So we, we must not grow bitter at God. Think hard thoughts about God as if he is withholding what is best for us. When prayer appears to go unanswered, or God says no, we understand that if we knew everything that God knows and is doing in our lives and in this world, we would actually agree with him because he is all wise. He is full of loving kindness. He is the God of peace who is present with us. Verse 33, 
Here's a prayer that we can be confident that God will answer when we pray. Add this short sentence to your prayer life as you pray for others. May the God of peace, what's most important no matter what the life situation, may God himself be present in our lives and in the lives of those whom we love. Here then is we remember that God will never abandon or forsake his people, but we want to ensure that whatever we're praying for when it comes to circumstances changing, the health improving, the financial situation shifting, what is most needed is God. And so we pray for those whom we love that each one would experience his realized presence. They would experience peace from the presence of the God of peace who promises to be present. And a prayer like this reminds us that striving prayer does not have to be long to be effective and fruitful. In fact, Jesus warns us about piling up words in prayer as if more praying equals better results or longer prayers. In fact, Paul models throughout his letters so many prayers that that over the years we've seen some of and we do well to take hold of and incorporate into our prayer life. They're short. You ever notice they're pretty short? But they're gospel-centered. They are informed with the knowledge of God. Now, striving prayer does not mean, well, if I just keep talking, that'll get me to effective prayer life. No, it is a fervency, it is a faith in God. It doesn't have to be long. It is fervent. And it is striving for the good of others, to the God of peace. Let me close with this. John Stott again says, Prayer is an essential Christian activity. And it is good to ask people to pray for us and with us, as Paul did. But there is nothing automatic about prayer. Praying is not like using a coin-operated machine or a cash dispenser. The struggle involved in prayer lies in the process of coming to discern God's will and to desire it above everything else. Then God will work things out providentially according to his will for which we have prayed. So, Living Hope Church, let, let us set ourselves anew to praying in this way for one another, striving in our prayers for one another because we all live under the reign of our gracious Lord Jesus Christ and his his spirit has entered our lives producing affection and love for one another. Let's pray. Let's strive together in our prayers for the advancement of the gospel and the good of God's people. So that, as John Piper says, we don't act like colossal fools and miss the opportunity and the privilege of bringing to pass events in the universe that would not take place if we didn't pray. Amen. Let me invite the worship team to come forward. We're going to conclude by singing two songs that press into the character of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's why. So that we leave this place aware of his character and his kindness and his willingness to listen as we pray. But before we sing, let me invite you to pray with me one more time. Heavenly Father, when we see what Paul is describing here, every born-again Christian sees the loveliness of living in this way, living together in a lifestyle of fervent prayer for one another, watching you act on our behalf, aligning ourselves increasingly with your will as we pray. For so many of us, though, prayer can be difficult, wearisome. We're distracted. We are weighed down by cares. So I pray that you would work in each one of our hearts by your spirit so that as we leave 
this place. We would have fresh stimulation to pray in ways that you call us to throughout your word. So grow us up in faith and in faithfulness as a church, we pray. And I pray for any who are experiencing fear, sorrow, emotional darkness. I pray that each one would feel your presence, that you, the God of peace, would be present personally, and they would feel your everlasting love for them. Pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.